were going. They, they looked like they were having fun. I was just gonna. Fun? If you were to die tomorrow, would you rather have wasted your day in sin or done something meaningful? Like memorize the book of Daniel. Oh, well, neither of those really sound like what I want to do. I heard those boys listen to that. Miley Cyrus. You still want to have fun with those boys? You want to play with those Philistines? Mm-hmm. It's only board games and Christian music for you, young lady. Hello, Shoreline. You're doing good, doing good. It's great to be here. Hey, if I become a Christian, I won't have any more fun. I tell you, that's what I was thinking about when I was in high school, about ready to go to college, and people were talking to me about becoming a Christian. And I went, oh, my goodness. I don't know. I mean, I've met a lot of Christians, and most of them look like they were baptized in lemon juice and just were, you know, kind of just weird. You know, they're kind of goofy. This kind of goofy people. And, and I remember thinking, boy, you know, if I give my heart to Christ, if I become a believer, I become a Christian, I do all I, I, I know what God's going to do. He's going to make me marry some unattractive girl, <laughs> call me to be a missionary down in Africa, put me in a mud hut. I mean, I, I really, and I thought, oh, no, no. I just, I, I was not feeling it, right? And so, you know, some people look at Christians and see, their boring life. You know, they look at Christians, they go, wow, that person has a boring life, and I don't want it. And the truth of the matter is that, you know, a lot of those Christians that have boring lives, they were boring before they became a Christian. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, that's just the way it is. But still, there's that part of you that goes, I mean, what, what am I projecting? You know, what am I showing a, a Christian is? Do people look at me and go, wow, I, you know, you really, you know, I, I want what you got. And that's, I think, a, a legitimate question for us to really look at, too. What are we doing as a church? And one of the things I'm just so thankful to Pastor Kevin and our staff here is that they work hard to give their very best, not just on Sunday, even though Sunday is a very high profile, but, but all the days of the week to do a great job of ministry that really communicates the aliveness and the, uh, the excitement of the Christian life. Like we talked about the group going down to Honduras and stuff, and, and some people are going, well, I don't know about that. I'm kind of thinking more about Bali. But, you know, I, 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 and I know I get it. You know, there's different, you know, the kind of like what, what is important. But the point is, is that there's a lot of misconceptions about the Christian life. And I think we as Christians add to that. Um, we make it sometimes real confusing. Well, I, I know that we don't mean to, but a lot of times we do exactly what Jesus was battling with the Pharisees, the whole legalistic thing, following the law. And, and we do that. And in a lot of churches, the, the issue is not what you do as a Christian, it's what you don't do. You know, I don't dance, I don't gamble, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls that do. I mean, you know, that, that type of thing, right? <laughs> and if that's, if that's the issue, my dog Kona is the best Christian. He doesn't do any of that. He's never, you know, gone out and, and gotten drunk. And, you know, I, I, he's, he's been a really great Christian dog. But, you know, it's not, I mean, the sad thing is, is that a lot of people really do have an image of Christianity based on, uh, what they see. And many Christians pride themselves on what they don't do. And that is worried about what people see on the outside and not caring about the content of the character on the inside. And God cares about what's on the inside. And who you are when no one's looking is your character. And that's what God cares about. And we're, so, you know, let's face it, all you guys got up this morning, first thing you do is, you know, you, you look in the mirror and go, oh. And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, we always see, even in staff, you know, we take staff pictures. And when, when, you, when you take a picture, a group picture, who, who do you look for when you first see the picture? Yourself, right? And you're, well, that doesn't look like me. Yeah, it does. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Right? I mean, we really care about the outside look. And you got up this morning, and you did all the repair work you could before you got here. 
can I wear this, honey? No, that, that, no, they don't wear that. You know, and, 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 you know, it's just funny. It's just the way it is. You know, that, that terrible question, your wife looks at you and puts something on and says, does this make me look fat? Be careful how you answer those questions. You know, I mean, but, you know, but seriously, that, that whole thing of, of how we look on the outside is something we all struggle with. And we sometimes really let that get into our spiritual life of thinking that that's what really counts. And the sad thing is it doesn't. And it sends mixed signals that really, I think, sideswipe us and, and friends that we want to come to know faith and come to know Christ because they're looking at some things that don't matter. And uh, it's not only how we you know, look and act, it's, it's how we treat people. It's the way we live. We send a lot of mixed signals. And uh, when you think about it, what kind of life should Christians be living? I think that's the real topic this morning. Because a lot of people look at Christians and say, I don't want that because that looks like a real drag. And I'm not into that. I, I'd be bored to death. And yet if people really knew the truth, they'd be really surprised. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to look at the truth and see what God has to say. Let's look at what Jesus said about what kind of life we should have. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus makes this statement. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Would someone describe your life as a full life? Would someone look at you and say, hey, they have life to the fullest. Their life is amazing. I want to find out what they got. That's what my hope would be. Not that, again, that we're doing it for that reason, but that's the outward reflection is what really is on the inside. See, God made you. He designed you a certain way. He knows what's best for you, and that is why he gave us guidelines. Actually, rules. No, no, there were laws. See, God just didn't give us guidelines. He just didn't give... He gave us laws. Why? Because God looked down and said, my goal is that they wouldn't have any fun. Anybody having fun? <laughs> Got him. No, no, that's not God. And yet we think that that is God. Jesus said, I've come that their life can be full, abundant, rich, alive. That's God's plan. And God also knows that there are certain things that we shouldn't do because those things are going to really hurt us. Um, as we've had you know, our kids and raised our little ones, and, and there's times where you know, you, you're doing things that will protect them. Like, for instance, I remember we, we always had a, like a wood-burning stove, that type of thing. And in the wintertime, you got the little wood-burning stove going. And, and inevitably, the little kids see the, the glow of the fire. And it's like, ah, you know, and they waddle on over. And they, they want to put their hand, you know, right up on it. And, and I, you know, I'll growl, you know, stop them and pull them back. And, and if they could really articulate it, they'd probably look at me and go, Dad, you just don't want me to have fun. Well, no, it's I don't want you to burn your hand. We're going to go up to the emergency room and you're screaming and crying and for the next several months putting gauze on it and all that stuff. And you, No, I don't want you to get hurt. And our Heavenly Father is the same way. Unfortunately, sometimes we think we know better, right? We think we know what's the right thing to do. But the point is, is that the Bible was given to us. The Bible God gave to us as a love letter to us as well as a way to avoid regret, a way to know how's the best way to live. It's, it's our owner's manual, if you will. This is what you do. This is how you, you get the best out of life. Now, some people hear, you know, hear that and they say, well, you know, I, 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 I don't believe the Bible. I mean, I, it doesn't really apply to my life because I don't believe it. it it's kind of like the person that says, uh, you know, uh, I don't believe in gravity. Really? No, I don't believe in gravity. And because I don't believe in gravity, it doesn't apply to me. Really? Well, after church, we'll go on out here to the parking lot, and we'll put you up on the roof and have you kind of share with everybody your philosophy. And then as you jump off, all the way down, you can go, I don't believe in gravity. Splat. You know, I mean, obviously, just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it won't apply to you. And so there's a lot of people out there that says, well, I just don't believe the Bible, and therefore it's not going to apply. It still does. It's God's truth about how he made you. 
Well, on the other hand, some people say, well, you know, I just want to live my life the way I want to live it. I want to be free. I don't want any rules. I don't want any regulations. I don't want any strength. I just want to be free. Okay? Look at what Jesus said in John 8, 32. When they know the truth, the truth will set them free. You go, yeah, okay, great verse, great verse. Later on, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the truth. See, Jesus wanted us to know that he is the truth. And in Galatians 5.1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. See, when someone comes to faith, they come with their old nature, and they're given a new nature. As Paul talks about the old man and the new man. And when we come to faith... God not only forgives us and gives us a fresh start, he gives us a new heart in the way that he puts his spirit, his Holy Spirit, in dwelling in our life. For instance, if you look at the Old Testament and you, you read through the Old Testament and you see how God sent his spirit, and there were times where God would send his spirit, and in the Old Testament, the spirit of God would come and accomplish a certain directive accomplish a certain goal, and then he would no longer dwell, but he would leave. But Jesus said, if I go, I will send the comforter, the Spirit of God, God the Spirit. He will come, and for the first time, he will dwell here. And he dwells in the hearts of the believers. And the significance of this is that there's a change that takes place in our life. Now, before I became a Christian, I didn't really understand this. And I thought, hey, when those people become Christians, they give up all their freedom, and they've got to do what God tells them to do, where I'm free to live the way I want, right? That's what I was thinking. But watch what Paul says. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says this. As for you, you Christians... Before you became a Christian, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's Satan. Now, let me unpack this for you. He uses three words. The first, he says, As for you, you were dead. Now, I, I don't want to freak anybody out or... or, or or make anybody feel bad, but, but let's say I wheel in here a dead person and, and bring them up on stage here and uh, they got sheet over them, and, uh, but the, the, the two feet are sticking out, okay? Just no shoes, just you no know, socks, just two feet sticking out. Now, if I walk over to that, those two little feet, walk over, and I've got a little feather, and I go over to the feet, and I go... Now, I'm a grandpa, and I do that to my little grandkid. It drives them nuts. <laughs> right? But what does a dead person do? Nothing, we hope. Okay, all right, all right. All right. Now, I go get a, a hat pin, you know, one of those big, long hat pins, and I walk over to the feet, and I go, bing! You know, what does that dead person do? Hope nothing. nothing. Hope, yeah, you hope nothing. You know, it's okay. So, so, so what, what is the writer here? What is Paul trying to say? The word in the, the Greek here, this word dead, one of the major connotations of it is not able to respond. See, that's what a dead person, they're not able to respond. You can yell and scream, you can tickle them, you can poke them. They cannot respond because they are dead. So he says, for you, before you became a Christian, you were dead spiritually. You couldn't respond to God. And he says, and you were in your transgressions. And this word is a really, really a kind of a cool word. The, the word picture here is they had roads, but they weren't paved like our roads, a lot of, a lot of dirt roads. And they had carts, a very thin uh, metal wood wheels. When I say metal, they're strapped on the outside of the wood. And these carts would go down these roads, and over the years of usage, they would carve out grooves in the road. And these grooves would become very deep at times. 
and so deep that as you're going along, and all of a sudden you're going along and the groove starts getting deeper and you're, you're, you're all of a sudden in one of these grooves. And when you're in one of these grooves, you can't go left or right. You've just got to stay in that groove until it feathers out. You, you can't get out of it because if you try to get out of it and turn, you'll twist that wheel and, and break it. So what he's saying here is you're going along in life caught in one of these troughs, not able to get out, not able to decide when you're going to get out. You're going to get out when it lets you out. And so you are dead, not able to respond to God, going along life, caught in a rut, and in your sins. Now, in 1611, King James of England decided that we needed an English translation of the Bible. So everybody could read the Bible in England. That's old last week's. Uh, so, so he says, we want to have an English-speaking Bible for everybody in England. So he commissioned a group of scholars to put together the Bible. And we know it now as the King James Bible. And so they came across this word in this verse. And the word is sins. And everybody here goes, oh, I know what that is. Well, you know, no, not exactly. Because the word sins, when we context that word today, we, it was things that we're doing bad, right? Well, that's not what that means in, in 1611 in England. What it was this is this. The word in the Greek that they came across is a word that literally is translated missing the mark, missing the point. And so they go, oh, we've got a word for that. And they had, you know, back then, instead of skateboards, they had archery and, you know, stuff like that. And so kids and people, you know, they go, ooh, you know, well, you know, they did the, you know, the archery thing. And so if you go out there and you aim at the target, you take the arrow and you pick it and it misses the target. No, okay, it just flies. If you miss the target, they would go, center, meaning you missed the mark. So when they came across this, that's the word they put down. So let's read this verse again. As for you, before you became a Christian, you were going along in life, caught in a rut, not able to respond to God, missing the whole point of your life. And you were following the ways of the ruler of the air, and that is Satan. And so for me as a non-Christian, thinking I'm free to do whatever I want, and if I become a Christian, I'm going to be all these rules and regulations, I'm going to be a slave, that is the exact opposite of the truth. The truth is, is that I was a slave and didn't know it. And by coming to Christ, for the first time in my life, I became free. Free of guilt, free of condemnation and the results of sin, and free to become all that God made me to be. And that is fun. That is liberating. That is great news. And that is great joy. And to me, I think of... So many times Christians live their life in such a way that they don't communicate that. And in a very real sense, when we live our lives for Christ, uh, we may look like we're a slave to rules and stuff, but the reverse is true. We're for the first time really have a major change that takes place. And the Spirit of God comes in and lives in our hearts and starts making great changes in a great way. Now, as we grow in our Christian life, we start having a different change of desires. To give you an idea, there's Psalms chapter 37, verse 4. Look at this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. First time I read that, I go, woo, here's my desires, God. Fill the order. No, 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 no. Read it again. It's not that God is going to have my list of desires that I'm going to give him and he's going to fulfill. He is actually going to put desires in me that are new. He's going to put a whole new set of priorities in my heart. 
when I come to know him. Because for the first time, I have the spirit of the living God in my life to give me direction and give me uh, new insights that I've never, ever seen before. But put it this way. Let's say I put a table up here in front. And if, if you're not a Christian, I'm going to ask you to come up and put on the table all the things that are really valuable to you. So you come up and you go, oh, is my, is my, uh, my car, Arr. my golf clubs, Arr. my, uh, you know, my, my, my parties, Arr. you know, or, or my job, Arr. whatever it is. So you put all those things really valuable to you. And then I say, okay, well, when you look at Christianity, what are the things that are not very valuable to you? Oh, my gosh, are you kidding me? Uh, going to church, that's not very valuable. Put that down there. Uh, reading the Bible, no, 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 not very valuable at all. Put that down there. Praying, no, 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 put that down there. Serving God, no, no, put that down there. Uh, you know, what kind of music do you, you know, Christian music? No, no, put that down. So you got all these other things. Now, all the things that are valuable to you, we're going to put price tags on. And all those price tags are very, very high, all right, because those are valuable to you. All the things that are not valuable to you, we're going to put low price tags. Put those on there. Now, this is what happens. When you come to know Christ, when you take that step and ask the living God that Jesus would come into your life, his, his spirit comes and lives in you, forgive you, you're, you're, you're changed. What God starts doing is he starts switching the price tags. And those things that you go, I didn't even care about that, but now I kind of like, oh, there's some great things in the Bible. And I'm, and I'm reading this, and it's coming alive to me. And it's, it's not like it used to be. It used to be like eating sawdust. It just was, well, and now it's, it's rich. It's, 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 there's things that are happening here that I never get. And I like going to church, and I, I love Christian songs, and I, and, and I love being with, with believers and, and fellowshipping and, and serving God. And I mean, things change. And there's, a, there's a, not only a change in the, the things that you value, but there's a peace that, that you can't explain until you've experienced it, of knowing that there is a God who cares about you and loves you, and a God that has a plan for your life. And you're not just trying to make things work. No, he will guide and direct you. He created you for a purpose. You are not an accident. If you, uh, if you know me at all, and uh, we spend any amount of time together, about four minutes, um, you will know that I have kids, and uh, we, we uh, have seven, and, and five of them are now out of the house, married, and uh, doing great, and they're a great blessing to us. But we have still two at home, two boys. And... Like I said, if you spend any amount of time with me, you're going to quickly find out that uh, I brag about them all the time. And they're, they're, they're great kids, and they're really good quarterbacks. And I will just bore you to death talking about them, talking about them, all what they're doing, what they're accomplishing, how great they are, and on, and you're just going, oh, is he going to stop? <laughs> and one day it hit me. That's the way God is with you. He can't stop talking about you. He is just so excited about you. And some of us don't feel like that because you get all this negative feedback about everybody that's around you. But he does. He loves you so much. And when you do something that you know, you kind of went out there in faith and trusted him with something. He is so excited. The Bible says without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. So when you get somewhere and you're kind of dealing with something, all of a sudden, okay, God, I'm going to have the faith to trust you in this. Oh, my gosh. He cannot stop talking about you. And then when you see the result of that, it's just, it's just so exciting. 
it is just so thrilling to know that the God of this universe is not looking down at who's having fun and saying, stop it. I mean, no. He is, he is rejoicing. I, I love this verse. It talks about that uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says, who, God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He likes it when we enjoy stuff. He created it for that purpose. I like this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in, cre- in Christ, his, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. When someone is born again, the Spirit of God comes into him and changes him from the inside out. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus, who's a religious leader, comes to Jesus at night because he doesn't want anybody to see him because he was embarrassed. And he comes to Jesus at night and he says, Teacher, rabbi, point of respect. And again, this guy is part of the Sanhedrin. He's part of the ruling religious community. And he says to Jesus, what must I do to really get to heaven? And Jesus looks at him and says, you must be born again. And he says, how can I enter my mother's womb a second time? He says, no, no, no. A man is born of the flesh, but he's also born of the spirit. You must be born of the spirit. See, this is, to me, as a non-Christian, it was like, what? You mean there's more to what I'm seeing? Yeah. There's a whole lot more than what you're seeing. There's a part of you that is far more important than what you see and touch. And that's that spiritual dimension. Because this life here is so short. This is what I've discovered. When you get to the place that you're willing to let God be first in your life and trust him with everything, even over your own desires, then things get really fun. They really do. And you can't help but just go, wow. Sometimes I'll sit there and I'll think about what the trajectory of my life was before I came to Christ. And I think where God took me and what he did. And I just have to sit there and, you know, tears come to my eyes. I go, wow, I didn't do that. I didn't deserve that. And whenever you try to outgive God, you'll never win. You'll never win because he always outgives us. And when you say, okay, God, I'm in. I'm going to trust you as the God of my life, who's the God of the universe, and I'm going to take direction from you. A God-filled life is not without problems and trials, but it is the greatest adventure ever. And as you go along in your life, and you see God at work, and you see those promises come true in your life from God's word, and you see what he says to be validated over and over and over and over again. And not saying that life is Disneyland, but when you go through, in fact, Jesus said this, in this life you will have trials. So he came straight for you. You're going to have problems. He says, but I have overcome the world. So he is going to go with you and walk you through. And we always learn more through trials than we do through successes. That stinks, but it's the way it is. And I always like the easy stuff, right? But God says, no, no, no. I love you too much to let you have the easy stuff. You are going to learn so much through going through the tough times of life. And it makes life rich and full. And as you go along and start discovering how incredible God is, as, as I look around, and there's, there's people here that you and I share the same thing, and that is, is that we're in the fourth quarter. Okay? And pretty soon, we're going to see the runway lights. Just, just get, and it'll be sooner than you think. It's just the way it is. And as you start going through life and you live your life as a believer and you start seeing what God and you experience what God's doing and you develop that relationship that starts going deeper and deeper and all of a sudden you realize, you know what? I'm starting to get it. It's not about this place. This is the pregame warm-up for eternity. This is, as the writer in the Bible says, 
Life is like a vapor. It appears for a moment and it's gone. So this guy, this is going by real fast. And you start appreciating the fact that, wait a minute, you know what really is amazing? Is that there is a heaven and there is an eternity and there is a God that says, you know, I really love you and I want to spend eternity with you and I can't wait for you to be here. And we start realizing that there's more than just this. And it's going to be amazing. I think in the last 50 years, the church has undersold heaven more than anything else. It is everything. What profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul, his eternity? I read a great story that helps illustrate that this week. It's a story of a lady who uh, spent over 45 years in this one church. And she's elderly now, and she picks up the phone and calls her pastor. And she says to her pastor, can you and your wife come over this week? I, I need to talk to you. And he knew her very well, and, and he says, sure, I'll come over. And so he and his wife came over, and they sat down, and she looked at them, and she goes... I just, a couple of days ago, got tests back from my doctor, and he said, I have three months to live. And she says, it's been a great life. And I'm so grateful for what God has done. And she goes, I, I want you to do my service, but uh, I, I put together some information here, and, and she hands him this piece of paper, and she goes, here's, here's a list of songs that I'd like to have sung at my memorial service. And and here's a list of scripture verses that I'd like to have read. And then she looked at uh, the pastor's wife and said, here's the dress I'd like to be buried in. And then she said, Pastor, could you make sure that my Bible's right there next to me? I want people to know that that's so important to me. And so they talked a little more and prayed together and hugged and said goodbye, and the pastor started to walk out with his wife, and as he got to the door, she says, oh, one more thing, one more thing, pastor. Would you make sure that when I'm buried in that casket, that I have a fork in my hand? He goes, what? That I have a fork in my hand. A fork. She goes, yeah, a fork. And he looked puzzled for a moment. And she goes, Pastor, you know, for the last 45 years, on Wednesday night, we have that fellowship dinner. He goes, yeah. And every once in a while, there's an amazing dessert. And when there's an amazing dessert, the people that come out and collect our dishes say to us, keep your fork. The best is yet to come. So she's saying to everybody, the best is yet to come. This is not it. I'm so thankful. I mean, God wants to give all of us an amazing life, not free of problems, but an amazing journey with him. But remember, keep your fork. The best is yet to come. Let's pray. As we pause right now, my prayer is, is that if anyone is here that doesn't know you, Lord, would, would realize how much you love them and how much you have in store for them and that they would take that step of faith and say, God, I want to know you and I, I accept your son Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. Ask him to come into my heart and change me. I want to be your child. And for thus those of the, us that are here that know you, God, I, I pray that we can trust you with every part of our life. That we can get to the place where we say, God, take over. And that we can experience that adventure and that bounce in our step. And oh yes, that we remember to keep our fork. That the best is yet to come. An eternity with you, Lord. God who loves us and offers us a new life 
and an eternal life. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to hand off to our venues and say to you, thank you for